The E1 elimination reaction is the subject of this webcast and is a two-step process involving first dissociation of the leaving group from the substrate, and this is the slow step of the process, followed by a DE step, which is mediated typically by a base that's in solution. And so I'll draw your attention to the fact that when we draw this mechanism, we typically use water or a solvent, a mildly basic solvent, to deprotonate rather than the conjugate base of the leaving group. And to rationalize this, all you have to do is think about the pKa of HBr versus the pKa of H3O+, and ask yourself which will be more acidic, which conjugate base, Br-, or H2O, will be more likely to pick up that proton. Notice here as well that the SN1 and E1 reactions proceed through a common carbocationic intermediate. So in both cases, the slow step is dissociation of the leaving group. And so from this common intermediate, substitution is an alternative pathway. And so there are competing pathways going on within the E1 reaction manifold. With E1 reactions, we face the same problem that we faced in the E2 case in terms of regioselectivity. And so we can look at a typical E1 substrate, and we'll note a variety of potential alkenes that could form. So taking a look at this substrate here, you'll note that deprotonation of the methyl group, or this secondary carbon here, will lead to two different products. One in which the double bond is tri-substituted, and another in which the double bond is only di-substituted, along with the conjugate base of the leaving group and the conjugate acid of whatever base is used to deprotonate in the DE step. Now you'll notice here that we've identified the major and minor products using the same rule that we used in the E2 case. That is, the more substituted double bond leads to the more prevalent product. And the reason for this is exactly the same as the reason in the E2 case, with one minor exception. So if we take a look at the reaction coordinate diagram for this process, what we'll see is that, first of all, it should jump out at you that this is a two-step process. So just like SN1, it's a two-step mechanism in which the highest hump to overcome, or the highest activation energy, corresponds to that first step, dissociation of the leaving group. Once that occurs, that leaves us at a carbocationic intermediate, and now we have a choice in terms of which H plus can dissociate from the molecule to give a neutral alkenic product. If we dissociate one of these secondary hydrogens here, we'll generate this pink product shown here with this tri-substituted double bond. On the other hand, if we dissociate this proton outlined in, in uh, dotted blue here, we'll generate the blue product, which is only the di-substituted double bond. And note that for the second step of the mechanism, the exact same rule applies as applied in the E2 case. The more stable product corresponds to the lower energy transition state, and the less stable product corresponds to the higher energy transition state. And so what we can note is that the more substituted double bond will be formed both in greater amounts, which is indicated by its lower energy uh, as a product, and more quickly, which is indicated by its lower activation energy from the carbocationic intermediate. You'll notice here that although this second transition state is bimolecular in both cases, the mechanism is still called E1 because the transition state of the slow step involves only one molecule, this original starting alkohalide here. And the rate determining step is dissociation of that chloride. So hopefully after this survey of the various mechanistic pathways of elimination, you've learned to appreciate how we can use stability trends and the structure of molecules to really predict trends in reactivity. And this is sort of the basis that chemists use when they think about reactivity. We think about the structure of reactants, products, and transition states, and use these to rationalize reactivity trends 
using the reaction coordinate diagram and the energies of all these species as sort of a backdrop. And so as we move into talking about different kinds of reactions and reaction manifolds with, with new and different kinds of structures you haven't seen before, ask yourself, how do the structures that you're seeing relate to older stability trends that you've already seen, and how can you relate stability trends to reactivity? If you always keep in the back of your mind the structural trends that you've learned about, you'll have a huge leg up when we start talking about reactivity trends with unique structures that maybe you've never seen before.